So do you know our um, do you know our new uh, executive director, Martin Taylor? Of what? Uh, the new executive director of the network. No, who is that? Martin Taylor. Oh yes, I do. Yes, I've met him. Um, I, I don't know whether I know him well, but I've met him a couple of times. I met him when he was at UBC, and then I met him with Byron. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. He's going to be there Monday. Yeah, I heard that. Okay. Yeah. No, he's a good guy. He is. He's very he's good. Very good. You're dynamic, lucky. Very active. Lucky to get him. Yeah. No, I'm really keen on him. Yeah, he's that's... doing a great job uh, in a very little while since he's there. Yeah. No, that's the kind of guy he is. Yeah, yeah, he is, and he's also very nice. He's also nice. I mean, I like him. Yeah, because some people who are terribly engaged. <laughs> but he, he's a, he's good all around. No, I think I'm lucky to get him. You get along quite well so far, so good anyway. I I hope so too. Yeah, because he's a he's a good one to get. So it's two to two. Well, there are quite a number of people here. This is good. You never know on a Friday afternoon who's going to come and who's not. Hello. I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. I'm so good. Glad to see you. See you here. Yeah. Well, it's very good to be here. I'm yeah. excited. And there are people on the line apparently. Yeah, so yeah, it's all, it's this is good. Coast coast and... Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you could come. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you could come. In Montreal. Well, thank so you. I, it's it's Sarah. It's all her fault. Okay. <laughs> So thanks again for the uh, for the evaluation and as you uh, for him. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, that I was didn't a, see you then. Since that then. was easy to do. Yeah. So that was not a problem. Thanks a lot. It's the hard one, yeah. you know, that you think. Then, eh. then you don't want to. Yeah, exactly. How am I going to say that? A thesis no, no, this it. was this was straightforward, yeah. easy to do, and a pleasure. Yeah. So thank you for inviting me. Okay. Thanks. Goodness, we're going to have to move some more chairs around. People keep coming. No. Almost two. Whenever you're ready. I left my water up there. I hope that's not in your way. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Fortin. I'm the Knowledge Transfer Coordinator for the Canadian Research Data Center Network. Uh, welcome to this webinar with uh, Suzanne McDaniel. Um, I'd like to say from the start that this activity is organized with, uh, in collaboration with the Quebec Inter-University Center for Social Statistics, uh, as well as the Department of Demography of the University of Montreal. So we do have participants attending online, as well as, as in person here in the office of the Kicks in Montreal. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I would just like to take a minute to briefly present the network for those of you who may not be familiar with the, this research infrastructure. So, next slide, please. So, as you can see here, the network is truly a pan Canadian network, uh, almost from coast to coast except for PEI. Uh, it's a partnership between Canadian universities and Statistics Canada. Uh, we comprise overall 20, currently uh, 27 research data center, RDCs as we call them, and uh, located across the country, um, and it will soon be 30. So three will soon open, at least we hope very soon. Uh, and this of course includes uh, the KICS, which is itself a network within the network and comprises five uh, facilities uh, in Quebec at the University of Montreal, at McGill University, LUCAM, Laval University and University of Sherbrooke. 
RDCs, research data centers, are secure computer labs, and generally located on university campus, with one exception, in fact. And they allow researchers with an approved project to use the microdata files gathered by Statistics Canada, including from their household and longitudinal surveys, the census, and an increasing number of administrative data sets. I won't say very much more, uh, except to invite you to look at our website. Uh, you will see the address here, and I should turn this off. There you go. Uh, so I invite you to visit our website if you want to know more. And among other things, I'd like to point out the online bibliography, where you can find most recent publications. Um, as well as the data search engine, uh, which allow you to, to find which data set we hold uh, that uh, help you maybe with your own research. And lastly, acknowledge this, that uh, the network, the, our activities being uh, including data access, training the next generation of researcher, and knowledge transfer uh, are made possible by the financial or in-kind support of SHRC, CIHR, CFI, Statistics Canada, and of course, participating universities. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today. Work, please go forward. Just click on the front page. Sorry about that, okay. So Suzanne McDaniel, she is a Prentice Research Chair in Global Population and Economy, Economy, as well as Director of the Prentice Institute. She is Professor of Sociology at the University of Lethbridge. Her main research interests are demographic, aging, generational relation, family change, and the social impact of technology. And she does that in a lab course perspective. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and she's uh, also the recipient of many other research and teaching awards. Um, she's, she has a prolific research career, so she's the author of several books and research monographs, and uh, she published over 150 research articles and book chapters. She's a frequent uh, keynote speaker at national and international conference, and she's been an advisor to Canadian as well as foreign governments on various uh, social uh, issues. So, Suzanne, thank you very much for being with us today. Just before I give you the mic, I'd just like to say that uh, for those of you who are uh, listening online, I invite you, uh, the, we, Suzanne will be speaking for about 45 minutes, so please uh, we'll keep all your question to the end, and I, for those who attend uh, uh, by webinar, please write your question by using the question tab, and I will read it out loud for you. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. We want to use the this um, one. Is this working? I think yes. Okay. Yes. Then we'll try it. We'll see if it works. Is it working online too? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. The backup maybe. <laughs> Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here and online as well, but it's also wonderful to see some really good friends I haven't seen for a while, so I appreciate that. And I welcome the people online. Let me just uh, say first of all that this A in my name uh, that is not, it's here, is not some kind of affectation. There is another Susan McDaniel, and uh, it's caused great confusion and anxiety for me, actually, because she is now uh, president of the American Psychological Association, and so all kinds of people have called me and uh, congratulated me for this new role that I have, and I do not do psychology in any way. So that's why I put the A in the name, because it gets kind of confusing. I didn't, couldn't imagine that there'd be two of us. But anyway, uh, this uh, title is uh, not quite complete. Uh, the, the study I'm going to tell you about, uh, share with you, uh, and I'm delighted to do so, is multi-level. It is longitudinal and it is comparative, but it's also multi-method. 
So I didn't want to have all that in the title, but, but there's a qualitative component to this too. It's a small qualitative component, and I'll, I'll explain why we, uh, why we use that, uh, and why we built in that multi-method uh, in a moment. But let me just say, first of all, that there are two co-authors on the paper, and the unfortunate part is that neither one are, are here in the room, but one is online. So I always say to Boko, who can probably hear me, that all the tough questions go to him. So if, if he's hearing, I'm sure he's laughing. Many of you know Boko. Uh, he works with me now, but he did a PhD at the, at the University of Montreal. Uh, and Amber Gazzo is um, a sociologist at York University. There are more people involved in the project, but on this paper there are three of us. So let me do the requisite, requisite acknowledgments first. You'll be required to do that. This uh, research that I'm going to share with you is funded by SHRC, uh, Social Sciences Humanities Research Council, and it's a bigger project on U.S.-Canada uh, comparisons on uh, income inequality as people age. So the whole concept of this study is, is uh, longitudinal, and there are several streams. We all have projects with several streams and multiple papers, so quite a bit's been published on this, uh, from this project, and more is coming out. So it's in process, as well as a book is in process, to be published by the University of Alberta Press. Um, of course, we thank the research data centers at the University of Calgary and the University of Lethbridge uh, that really were enormously helpful. They're part of the, the CRDCN. Uh, and here we list what the CRCD is, is uh, sponsored by, uh, but all that is very much appreciated and the views expressed here do not represent CRCDN in any way. Now, the American data was a bit of an adventure and I'll tell you about that, but we used the National Survey of Families and Households in the U.S. Uh, and the, the funding information is provided here for that survey. Um, so. What we found in trying to do this particular paper is that the geographic codes that are contained within the Canadian National, Health, National Population Health Survey are not contained within the National Survey of Families and Households in the U.S. They, they put the data, they make it public, but they don't provide the geographic codes. So in order to do this multi-level analysis, we um, got a special order a data file containing geographic information from the NSFH team at the Center for Demography and Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they provided us with this top secret file that we had to keep in a specific drawer and sway or we wouldn't sell it on the open market or anything like that. Of course we wouldn't, but it was a, it's a confidential file. And what we did then was connect that, those geographic codes with the uh, NSFH data to do the kind of geographic analysis we wanted to do here. So that was a bit of an adventure. For the qualitative uh, uh, interviews, um, and I'll tell you about those as we go along. Uh, we thank the, um, the, the respondents, of course, for sharing their experiences and views, and to our research assistants, Jennifer Givens and Alicia Jones. Jennifer is now uh, an assistant professor at Washington State University, so that worked out pretty well. She was a PhD student when she did these interviews, and Alicia Jones, um, is a master's as a PhD student at the University of Manitoba now so uh, so it's interesting how they have really moved along okay context the context here uh, quite simply is that health inequalities are increasingly linked as virtually everyone knows there's a burgeoning literature on this to macro level social, economic, and political context. Now, I'm not going to cite a bunch of people here because the literature requires you to cite a lot, and if you leave somebody out, they get worked up and upset, and I don't want to do that. So I'm not citing anyone, but, but basically we know how this works. On the political context, I just want to insert something quite interesting, I think, that one of my postdocs in, at the University of Lethbridge, we had three in the Apprentice Institute, and one of them is working specifically on the health impacts of health inequalities in a political context. He's really pushing that forward. And uh, it's quite new and quite interesting. He's published a fair bit already uh, and a very ambitious young man. So I think this is something that we may hear more of. But that area of political context, not only policy, but the, the, the nature of the 
political context in a specific country. Uh, so I think it's quite interesting. The income inequality hypothesis, of course, we're talking about uh, the question is the level of income inequality within a geographic area uh, associated with health outcomes in the older population. And I emphasize in this study, I'll say it several times probably, not because I'm repeating myself, but because I, we're not doing entire life course. We're starting with people in midlife as they move into their later years, which occurs to us when I wrote this grant. Um, that that area has not been looked at. What we tend to look at, and this is a digression, but what we tend to look at in the literature thus far is, is, is comparisons of particular uh, age groups or cohorts. And what we're doing is following people from midlife to their later years in the two countries. So it's actually longitudinal. And when you do that, you see quite different things than when you compare people 85 now with people 45 and you say, and some policy people, not all, and I'm, not, I'm making a gross generalization, but sometimes people say, well, we're going to be just like those people 85 plus when we're 85 plus. And the reality is it doesn't quite work that way because we carry through our lives like snails all of these things. We carry on our back life course events that have happened to us. So that's where we're, our focus is. And in several papers, we unpack that more than we do in this one. This is a comparison. So the focus has been, and again, it's a gross generalization, largely on cross-sectional data, as I said. Um, there are some really good longitudinal studies of, that, that I'm not going to mention here, but largely the studies have been cross-sectional that ask this income inequality question. I thought it was a ghost. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, but yet there's widespread acknowledgement, and I've seen this in, in multiple articles and uh, conference presentations, that socioeconomic conditions and health have a complex time-dependent uh, 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 relationship, and analysis requires longitudinal repeated measures as well as looks at different uh, geographic levels. So we're trying to, trying to do a lot here. In this paper, what we're doing specifically is drawing on theory and research on a number of areas. One is social determinants of health, life course, welfare state, and examine the relationships between income inequality and health longitudinally among Americans and Canadians as they move into their later years from midlife. So we're starting, we define midlife arbitrarily as 45 plus. I don't mean to offend anybody <laughs> by saying that because some people think it starts earlier. Some people think if they're 45, it's not happening yet. You're not in midlife. So that's what we arbitrarily chose. Uh, we examine whether income inequality at various levels of geography, and we look at uh, essentially three uh, in this comparison, community and then state and province and country, is associated with individual well-being and in this respect, we look at it in two ways, physical, overall well, well-being, physical well-being, and mental health. And in mental health, we don't look at all the things because we can't, so we largely focus on depression. There are some other, other measures we use in other papers, but for the purpose of this paper, we're focusing on a depression index. So the research questions are very simple, actually, hard to answer, but easy to put. Do trajectories and overall well-being among adults in midlife vary by levels of income inequality within these geographic specificities? And does income in midlife mediate this relationship? And the second point is quite important because, as Sarah mentioned, I do some policy work, not only in Canada, but around the world, and some policy advice. And most of our policy, including in Canada and Quebec and around the world in OECD countries, is premised on the notion that income really is the key. So what you need to do is focus on bringing the incomes up of those people whose incomes are low and then things will be better. And in a couple papers from this project, we find it not exactly so simple as that. And in this paper, income inequality is the focus rather than, rather than low income per se. We're looking at income inequality. Um, so that question, even though it looks very simple, not straightforward necessarily. Now I'm including two charts here, uh, and one is out of date, but the concept is I want to be sure we're all on the same page, that income inequality has been vastly growing uh, since the mid-70s and growing faster in the United States than in Canada. 
um, leveling out a little bit in Canada, but we cannot be so proud of our record on this because our income inequality has gone straight up. Uh, we talk a lot about the U.S., but Gini coefficients, of course, are not the only game in town with this, and we have to look at spread. So I'm going to just mention this briefly again. We, we all know it in this room, I'm sure, and the people online. But if you look at the top 1% in the U.S., which is the yellow line way at the top, that has had huge gains in this period roughly the same period. This one goes 82, the previous one is 76. And then Canada has done the same thing at a lower rate. Uh, and then the top point, point 0.01 in Canada has increased also, but at a lesser rate. I didn't include the top point 0.01 uh, for the United States. But the story is not only income inequality going up, but the top really going up. So again, we all know that, but I thought it would just be important to uh, to mention it, make it clear. So again, the focus group, I've said now twice, I'll say it for a third time, 45 years and older, we look at nationally representative longitudinal samples. We use Gini coefficients, despite their limitations, um, to measure, to capture income inequality, and, and it's a comparative measure across countries and over time. And we consider a range of scales, state and province, uh, counties, metropolitan areas, census division, depending on how what they're called in the, in, the, in the data we're using, and two health outcomes, physical health and mental well-being, and I'll show you how those are measured. And then we use a qualitative component. So let me just tell you why we're doing this qualitative component. The two reasons, and it's fun to do this multi-method thing. The first reason is because whatever you do with quantitative data, it's always out of date. And if you're trying to match two countries, you're even more out of date because because it's, it's hard to get data that's relatively comparable, and we haven't done that. We, I mean, we're doing the best we can, but we can't do it. The second reason is qualitative, quantitative data, no matter how good it is, doesn't allow you to get under the surface of things, what people think, how they manage, how they relate, that kind of thing. So that's why we built in this qualitative component, which rather leads to some rather interesting conclusions, and so I'm going to share that with you as we go through. Now. When we talk about um, health and uh, inequality in the U.S. and Canada, we realize that the Americans and the Canadians who are facing health challenges as they go forward, health care challenges in this case, are very different kind of cats. So in the United States, I just want to emphasize this to you, this does not have Canada on it, but 19% of Americans 65 and older have skipped getting health care, getting medical care, because they can't afford it. And that's a very different reality than in Canada, which is why I want to use this as a background for, the, for what we're going to talk about. The focus is not on health care, but this creates a kind of a, 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 a surface around which issues arise with respect to health and well-being of older Americans and older Canadians. The issue in Canada is a little different, um, and this is not um, something that I'm espousing that baby boomers are causing the problem, but wait lists in Canada are a bigger issue, particularly for chronic conditions, than for um, affordability. Now, there are affordability issues for people that can't afford pharmaceuticals that aren't covered by provincial plants and all that kind of stuff, or, or uh, long-term care facilities. So I'm not saying that's out of the question, but waiting lists are a big issue for hip replacements, for um, a whole variety of treatments that sometimes uh, people need as they age. But again, not everybody, and not all the time, and so aging is a good thing, as we talked about earlier. When we said we're getting older, uh, I'm wondering who would want to not get older? Well, the option is you die young. I mean, that's not so happy. So the option of getting older is a good thing, really. So uh, challenge, the challenges, I've got to go through these. Um, lots of challenges in doing comparative longitudinal research, and many of you in this room know this very well. So I'm talking to the people who don't know it very well. Um, whenever you make comparisons across groups, there are challenges because the data don't match, the, the, the questions don't match, the, it's very difficult. Comparable data is often not available, so you've got to kind of hunt it up and make it work. 
uh, changes in survey methodology at Stats Canada. We go round and round and round on this. I've been um, involved in the uh, National Stats Council for many years, and before that I was chair of the um, Demography Committee at Stats Canada, and this issue of survey methodology and question consistency hugely different. Uh, variations are, exist in availability and quality of vital events or census data. Uh, we certainly know that in Canada when 2011 the denominators fell out of everything we were doing because we had no, no long-form census. Uh, and often cultural differences in self-reports of overall health come in and they come in in our study, I think. We're not sure, but I think they come in in a big way. You know, people say, how do you feel, how would you rate your health? It's culturally determined, you know. You can say, yeah, it's great. You don't want to be a problem to people, or you can say, gee, I have a sore toe today, you know. My health's bad. It, you know, it's, it's culturally determined. So we have to, even though it's reliable across studies, we have to be careful of that. And comparability of self-reported depression symptoms maybe even more culturally determined. Um, and then, of course, the challenges are related to subjectivity of analysis and discontinuity of data with which we're very familiar with longitudinal surveys. Although I will say that Stats Canada is doing a fantastic job to extend the life of some longitudinal surveys. So if you don't know that, you might want to look into it because they're really doing a good job. It doesn't mean they're going to reinstitute them in, in their former state, but they're matching data, doing using administrative data. So there's a lot of things going on that are that are very interesting at Stats Canada with, with respect to that. Okay, these are our data, our quantitative data. And we've got nine cycles of the National Population Health Survey. Uh, we start out with a sample of 6,627 uh, people, and then we have individual characteristics and geographic unit identifiers, great stuff. U.S., we don't have this kind of thing. So what we decided to use was the, the National Survey of Families and Households for two waves, and they don't, they're not the same dates, uh, relatively similar people, but different dates. Um, and then we merged, as I mentioned, the um, geographic identifiers from the census that we were provided with. Let me just give you an idea of the, the concept here. Respondents in the Canadian, I don't have a comparable thing for the US, so I'm just giving you a sample here. Uh, the respondents age 45 in cycle four of the NH NPHS were followed over a two 10 year period, so they would have been uh, uh, in 2010, 11, 65 to 74 and people 65 plus in 2000, um, 2000 when it started, 2001, uh, would be 75 plus. Now the crucial thing about this, which I find fun, is that this covers the period of the Great Recession, which started in 2008. So we're, we're following those people through that rocky road wasn't it rocky in Canada as in the United States, but it was rocky. So there was this kind of intersection of biography and history you know, the moment, historical moment when things happened and the economy uh, were there too. So these, I'm not going to go through all this, but they, these are our methods, multi-level regression modeling, uh, random intercept logic models, uh, where we can estimate both within and between individual variants, uh, data not strictly hierarchical, uh, neighborhoods are time varying and geographical unit identifier was not available in those data so we made the special requests as I told you and then merged these. So for analysis all data were placed, uh, all qua quantitative data were placed in the University of Lethbridge RDC. The family, the US data, the survey is public. <laughs> so we had to put it into the RDC to do the comparisons then it became private. So it all has to be vetted coming out of the RDCs. I'm not complaining, it works, but golly, before that we were running back and forth, uh, which is okay because the RDC at the University of Lethbridge is on the same floor as the Prentice Institute. But nonetheless, you have to sign in, sign out, run back, look at the computer, run back in. So we had to put it in there and then it has to be vetted even though it started out as public. Life's interesting. So for, the, for measuring well-being, we use uh, self-reported health for both because it's comparable. And this is widely used in the research. People complain about it, but it has been found to be reliable with the proviso that I mentioned earlier that I think it's culturally filtered very much. Um, and even momentarily filtered. 
you know, you can say one moment your health is great and then you get tired and you're maybe not so great. You got the sniffles and not so great today, but yesterday I was great. So I think there's a lot of individual variation. For the purposes of this analysis, we dichotomize the variable uh, into good, which is combining good, very good, and excellent, and poor, of combining fair and poor. A lot of studies have done this, so this is not extravagant uh, or going so far uh, beyond what we do. Uh, for the self-reported psychological distress, I mentioned this uh, earlier, uh, we use uh, the K6 distress scale for mental health, which has been uh, uh, used elsewhere uh, as an indication of psychological distress. And then for the U.S. data, there's the Center for Epidemiologic Studies depression scale. So these are standard scales that can uh, indicate what's happening. And uh, on the, we, we make these into dichotomies as well. Um, so for the um, K6 distress scale, a, scale, a score of four or more is indicative of severe or relatively severe psychological distress. And in the CESD scale, we dichotomize it. Zero is low, uh, and then it's less than 20, and then one is high depressed with two, two, excuse me, 20 or more. So the income inequality measure, um, everybody pretty well knows this, so I won't dwell on it. Gini index, uh, the Gini index we do for annual household income, adjusted for household size. So that, that's crucial to know. Uh, and it measures inequality, so everybody knows pretty well that a low Gini indicates more equal distribution, a high one is less equal. And then the quartiles of area geographic level income inequality over time are for these geographic areas. So we calculated them for those areas, not for the, well, we calculated for country too, but for specific areas. So we're looking at how income inequality affects people um, within geographic areas. Now for the control variables, it, it's the standard stuff. <laughs> The, the, uh, so, so I'm not going to go through all this, um, but, but it's, it's the standard stuff. The crucial thing is that we did standardize for household income quartiles, which means that we're trying to standardize a control for that and look at the effects of income inequality. So uh, I'll show you some, some results on that in a moment, but that's, that's an important consideration. So with respect to some some uh, findings. What slide is this? I have to get uh, clear what it is. Okay, so we have here, yeah, on, on your um, right, uh, overall health, poor health. We're only looking for this. I'm selecting slides here. We're only looking at self-rated poor health, uh, and Canada in this case is in blue, and the U.S. is in red for no clear reason and certainly nothing to do with politics, if anybody's been looking at politics lately in the U.S. Nothing to do with that. And what you see for overall health is uh, a pretty clear gradient uh, by income. So this is purely income rather than income inequality. Uh, the, the surprise to me was that if you look at uh, household income quartiles, that the U.S. and Canada in the lowest are so similar in terms of uh, self-rated poor health, because in subsequent analyses you'll see they diverge quite a lot. But in this case, it's a it's a pretty well a slide right down. So uh, and and in every case, um, Canada is a, a little bit um, high uh, higher, which is a bit of a surprise, uh, but but not a lot. Uh, and for the lowest uh, uh, lowest group, uh, lowest income group, it's the same. So if we look then at self-rated poor mental health, which is on your left, um, a little different picture emerges, and I'm not quite sure why. But we have the same kind of uh, pattern for the lowest uh, uh, people that they have uh, equal equally poor uh, self-reported high depression symptoms. But when we look at how it slides down, it, it changes. And so for the highest income, Canada has a higher rate of self-reported high depression symptoms than the United States. Now, I don't know whether that means we are more depressed and we have high incomes and we're still depressed, 
or whether there's a cultural factor going on there, because it's a bit of a surprise. But our focus is not on income per se, it's on income inequality, but this is a little bit of a, a different outcome I found. So here we go on trajectories, um, and in this case what we have is Canada on Canada on the right, it's reversed for me, Canada on the right and the U.S. on the left. The U.S. would never be on the left, but there it is. Um, and in this case, uh, the top two graphics are overall um, health, overall poor health, and the bottom ones are overall poor mental health. Now, we're going to have to partly discount the, the U.S. trajectories, except to say that when we have the lowest, uh, when we have the highest uh, incidence of income inequality, uh, it, the, the, it, the poor health outcomes are greater. The other thing to be said about the U.S. here is that the scales um, are not quite the same. Um, so the the um, I don't have a pointer here, but let me just let me just point out that on the on the axis here. Uh, where this uh, blue bar starts at the top with the lowest quartile uh, of income, uh, lowest quartile of, um, sorry, lowest quartile of income at the top here, uh, the four is right at the edge of the graph, and in the U.S. the four is where the blue bar begins, so they're not quite on the same scale. So what we note then is that the, the lowest quartile in the U.S. has a heck of a lot more um, um, poor health and self-reported um, uh, problems with depression than does Canada, which I think is, is quite important. For Canadians, uh, all income groups worsen with age, um, but they jump. They don't just worsen with age in a straight line going up, they worsen with age at um, cycle three of the uh, NHPS. So that means that these people are, you know, kind of probably entering um, 50s, 60s, and of course the older ones in the first in the first, uh, in 2000, 2001 are, are entering 65, 75. But there's a jump there, and I think from the policy point of view, this notion that um, you know old age has this this trajectory into trouble uh, it is not quite borne out by this. But it clearly is related to to um, income, uh, and that and that is um, important. That the higher income people have less of a jump into poor health as you can see here with the yellow bar or mustardy colored bar at the bottom, but they also have a much lower level of poor health throughout their, their, their years. So that means as we all get better off, hopefully we'll be better off in terms of well-being. In terms of this, this second um, uh, uh, graph for Canada, Jeez, I'm not very good at right and left, but on the, on the right here, the second graph on the bottom. Uh, what's interesting about that is, uh, first of all, the jumpiness of, uh, of symptoms uh, of depression, uh, which I find quite interesting. The peak is, in, is probably slightly in cycle seven here. Uh, we have the same pattern of, of um, income differentials, but the the lowest, um, I'm sorry, the highest at the bottom, the, the yellow line at the bottom, the highest income is not that different from the second quartile of income. So, in, you know, it's almost as if income is not so protective of depression symptoms, which kind of gets us back to that first bar graph I showed there. But the jumpiness of this is quite interesting. Uh, and my sense is that when, and again, I veer into policy without really making any policy prescriptions, but my sense of it is that when policy thinks about mental health, they tend to think about two things, and, and, and this could be the way I see it, it could be wrong. They're talking a lot about university students, young people, which, which is perfectly justified, and I don't have that on the graph, so it's perfectly justified. And then they talk about old, really older people. But this shows, I think, that there are problems that are emerging related to income uh, 
when you're not necessarily extremely old, but the problems are occurring and, and the jumpiness of bounciness, if you like, across, across time for individuals, because these are following individuals. You know, this is not looking at people of a specific age. This follows individuals. And if you think about it, it probably makes sense. We all have this bounciness in our life. You know, you go, you go along and things go well and then somebody dies or somebody, uh, you lose a job or, you know, something happens and boom, you're, you're upset for a while, you're depressed for a while and then you bounce back or, you know, I mean, we, it really reflects, I think, most of our lives if we, if we uh, look at it seriously. So let's move along here. In terms of looking at geographic specificity here, um, this is uh, looking at, it, it's a different way to calculate it, but I don't want to show you all the graphs, multi-level odds ratios for, again, self-rated, fair, or poor health by area and income inequality quartiles. So these quartiles are income inequality. They're on the left, are, are income inequality quartiles. And the only one that pops out as significant, although you can see differences from one, which is perfect inequality, or perfect equality. Uh, the only one that jumps out as statistically significant is the third quartile of income inequality at state level uh, and for the U.S. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if that means anything or not, but it, it's interesting that it's not the top one or the bottom one. So this is a summary of the association between community level income inequality quartiles and well-being outcomes. And this is community level, so it's a summary. And we see that self-rated poor health is significant at the state level for the U.S. So it's not at the neighborhood level, it's at the state level. And in Canada, we seem to find that self-reported high depressive symptoms are statistically significant at the, at the province level. And everything else sort of washes out in terms of statistical significance. So to me, that's quite interesting and consistent with the bar graph I showed earlier and some other things. So what is this uh, multi-level odds ratio for mental health? And here we see it's the same thing. These quartiles are genie levels for specific um, uh, 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 regions, specific levels, geographical levels. And at the provincial level, we see here the, the same thing we saw a little bit earlier. The third quartile is the vulnerable one, not the top one. When the, you have moderate income inequality, we'll call it that, not the very highest, it seems to have a greater effect, statistically significant effect on depressive symptoms. Uh, than the highest one, but the highest one is also statistically significant, but goes in the opposite direction. You know, finding these things is fascinating because you say, you know, is it statistical artifact? What the heck's going on? You know, it's really hard to know. So here is Canada for trajectories of the two together. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the qualitative uh, studies, which I think you'll find interesting. Hope you will. Um, trajectories of self-rated poor health and self-reported high depression symptoms by provincial level income inequality. We focused on province because it came out as being important that level. And you find, again, this bounciness uh, of, of uh, across the life trajectory, but also the consistency of income uh, income inequality, when it's, when it's um, uh, lower, uh, it, 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 there's less, uh, less um, health problems throughout. So this is only at the provincial level. This is not uh, throughout. So qualitative data. Um, this was actually good fun, but also very depressing. Um, we should have rated us all on a depressive index ourselves, I think, because this was really interesting. We did in-depth interviews with two classes of people, working class people and middle class people, Canadians and Americans, so it's a four by two, two by two table, in midlife and living in two comparable cities. And the comparable cities are anonymous, but they're, um, they're similar in size, similar in age structure, similar in ethnic diversity. We tried to, to do that kind of thing. And interviews were conducted at two points in time. And this is really quite fun. The only good thing about the recession, 
the Great Recession in 2008 is that we were actually in the field doing these interviews when the economy tumbled, which is interesting because that, in fact, led to some very interesting results uh, because, well, I'll just tell you briefly one of the, one of the findings because it really was interesting to me. The Americans at the time in their interviews said, nah, this is not a serious thing. We're fine. We're going to bounce back. This is not a serious thing not to worry. <laughs> this is the optimism that comes through later. I'll show you in a minute. But that's what they said when we were in the fall of 2008 interviewing them and Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs did it go belly up. Lehman Brothers went belly up. There was the emergency and everybody's running around in Washington trying to say the world is going to collapse. The financial empire is going to collapse. We have to intervene. You remember that. It wasn't that long ago. And it's still having effects on people, um, serious effects on, the, on, on people in the U.S. and somewhat in Canada, but less so. But these people were happy campers. They were saying, this isn't going to last. We're fine. So uh, very interesting that we were in the field at that time. And then we interviewed again in 2013. I emphasize we did not interview the same people because we had to, according to human ethics, um, <laughs> which we had to get at four universities, human ethics approval, we couldn't contact the same people because we couldn't retain their names and stuff, so we couldn't. That's another story of how to do this kind of research. So the focus here is on interviews with Americans and Canadians aged mid midlife uh, in 2008-2010 and the same age group in 2013. And we analyzed these data with an in vivo which was a discourse and frame analysis, uh, which was an interesting kind of approach. So how do we get these people? Well, we recruited middle class Americans and Canadians uh, through speakers clubs. It was through the Toastmasters, but we're not allowed to put that in the paper. But Toastmasters um, is a kind of a middle class sort of thing that people go to to learn how to get up in front of a crowd and speak whether they need to or not. And so it's a very middle class kind of a thing. Working class people generally don't do that so much. So that's how we recruited them. And then, because we're not allowed to call people up and say, oh, by the way, what class are you in? Can't do that. So how do you find these people? And so working class respondents, we went to drop-in centers and community centers in lower income neighborhoods in both cities. And what we did was not do any blind interviews. We got people to consent to do an interview at these locations. And then we booked the interview with them. So it wasn't calling them up on the phone and saying, you know, would you talk with us? We, we booked it with them personally at, for this time, and that, that's how it worked. Um, so it was not um, it was not any kind of uh, random blind what did they call it cold call kind of phenomenon. Uh, research had human ethics approval from four universities because the collaborators on this project were in multiple universities. That also was a fun thing to do. Okay, so here are some findings. Uh, Middle-aged Americans, and I mentioned this earlier, have strong faith in what they call the American dream, and this is one of our frames. We asked them, uh, do you believe that your kids will do better than you will do, than you have done? Do you believe that your hard work will pay off in your kids' generation or your younger relatives' generation? They do. Despite the fact the reality is right before them that that's not happening, they believe it. And they were experiencing greater adversity in the 2008 recession but they were saying, no, no, this still we have this great faith. It's really interesting to hear this. And the sense of optimism was among the Americans was among the key findings from the U.S. interviews. Now, let me just put in parenthetically here. My hunch is that that, uh, that optimism that they were expressed in these interviews probably or might have affected the self-reported health and the self-reported uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, and the, and the uh, totally different way to ask it, that might be a cultural filter because they were very different in this. I'll give some specific findings as, uh, in a moment. American respondents expressed worry about their own financial security, uh, particularly in 2013. They did realize then this thing was serious. Houses were being foreclosed, they were losing their pensions, they were losing their jobs. So they said, what are we going to do in the future? But they said, I express optimism about their children's future. And one of the, one, it's absolutely fascinating to, to do this kind of work because one of the things they said 
was we have great optimism about the U.S. educational system as being a propeller for mobility. Well, pretty well everyone knows that's not the case. And there are very good schools here, very bad schools there. They keep you where they are rather than being a mobility trajectory. I mean, Korok's work shows that. Um, but, but, but still, that's what they have this view about it, whether the empirical evidence seems to support it. So this is all in spite of declining intergenerational mobility in the US. Um, don't want to make it all, all uh, tough on a Friday afternoon. Um, this quite says it all, really. Um, the rest of us go here on the broken elevator and the wealthy go up. Uh, and it's the generation's agenda, income inequality. So it's been busted since the 70s. Um, so I don't want to go too far into this American route because there is a study that came out in June 2016 from Stats Canada. You may have seen this. Um, which does conclude, and I've only got the conclusion here, a child's future income level in Canada is more strongly determined than we previously thought by the parent's uh, status. So what, what Miles Korak talks about is stickiness. It means that you're kind of stuck to your parent's uh, status and your chances of mobility beyond them is a little bit more limited than we like to think. At the same time, they clearly show that the mobility in Canada is higher than in the United States. That's clear, despite the mythology and the mythology about the American dream. But I just want to make that caution. So here are some findings. While Canadian respondents, fascinating stuff here, while Canadian respondents believe that hard work and sacrifice will lead to a better future for their children, many expressed doubt about their children's prospects. And more Canadians thought their children's lives would be a real struggle. On well-being, this is just a brief summary because I could list quotes, but that gets kind of tedious after a while. Every single American we talked to, every single one in 2008 and in 2013 mentioned concern about health care costs. Every single one um, as they age. There wasn't a person who didn't mention it. Nobody mentioned that in Canada. So what they came up with is quite different. Uh, worries about financial burdens for both themselves and their younger or same age relatives came up again and again in, 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 in uh, the US interviews. In the context of static salaries, no rise in income, job precariousness, they saw that particularly in 2013, and many noted and they said out loud the psychological and physical toll that the worries are taking. They all sort of said that, which, which allows imp uh, us to interpret things better on the quantitative data. And interestingly, many mentioned concerns about chronic illnesses over which they have no control, such as inherited conditions. Now, this blew my mind and everybody on the project because this, again, is flies in the face of this notion of bootstraps and go get itness and stuff in the US. This is fatalism. This is saying, gee, you know, nothing I can do. I inherited something from some bad gene and I'm gonna get a bad disease as I age and nothing I can do. We puzzled and puzzled and puzzled about this and then we came up with a hypothesis and it's only a hypothesis, but it'd be really interesting to test this at some point, that in the American system of medical care, you go to a doctor and everybody's concerned about being sued, medical malpractice, they have medical malpractice suits like crazy. So each time you go to a doctor, and our respondents told us this, they ask you about your history, your family history, each time. So it's kind of put into your brain that family history matters so much because each time you're told about it. So it flies in the face of the notion that you can do something about your health in the future. Canadians, I'll just tell you because I have it on a slide in a minute, Canadians had the opposite view. They didn't mention any of these things. These inherited conditions they mentioned, they were specific. Disease names that I never heard of. You know, specific things that you wouldn't think that people would know about. Even working class people mentioned these specific medical conditions that they inherited. And I think, how the heck are they, why are they dwelling on that? What's going on? So I don't know whether that's true or not, but it was interesting because the Canadians said, and we have it here, um, here we go. Canadians never mentioned, it's at the bottom, never mentioned inherited diseases as a worry. They mentioned stress, but then we said, well, what do you do about stress? Well, I go for a walk, I work out. I'm taking charge of this. 
it's the exact opposite than, than what the ideology, the mythology would say. Canadians are taking charge, Americans are saying, sorry, that's the way it is, nothing we can do. Absolutely fascinating, and it was a recurrent pattern, it wasn't something that just popped up. So Canadians were also concerned about financial challenges, but say at least they will have access to health care. So the basic health care is covered, makes them feel easy. Job uncertainty is mentioned, but not as much of a concern as among Americans. Canadians more worried about their younger relatives not doing better than they are, but the exception were immigrants. Our immigrants feel confident that their kids are going to do better, even in a bad economy. Now that can be that their, kid, that their immigrants are not doing as well, and so if your kids do better, even a little bit, that's, that's encouraging. So it could be a negative thing too, but they were very positive about the kids will do better for sure, um, which is interesting. So discussion and conclusions. Uh, we examined these relationships. Uh, evidence for income inequality hypothesis uh, is mixed. Midlife Canadians, as they age, are more susceptible to harmful mental health effects of income inequality at the provincial level, which I don't really think has been heard much. Uh, I hope not, because we want to do something new. Um, Americans are more prone to overall health challenges with aging and at a worse level. So poor challenges, poor health in Canada is not as bad as poor health in the United States. Um, and that's at the state level. Lower income, household income, is strongly associated with fair or poor mental health outcomes in both countries, but does not fully mediate the, the inequality effects. So there's a separate effect of inequality. The qualitative anal analyses are, not, of course, not able to shed light on geographic levels because two cities and two countries. But for country level, it's clear that inequalities are taking a toll on well-being with age, particularly in the United States. And it's intergenerationally linked, which I think is also something that's been missed. That if, you're, if your health is affected, your, your, not only the children's inheritance is affected, but the children are catching your worry. And so it also means that you're all huddled together and not, nobody's being very mobile. So intergenerationally linked, it's also true in Canada, but less so. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. So it's uh, two to five to two. So we have uh, uh, several minutes to take questions. So please, uh, for those of you who are listening online, uh, please write it out on clicking the question tab, and I will read it for you. So we'd like to break the ice. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Tom Legrand, uh, University of Montreal Department of Demography. Um, I found your presentation very interesting. I find I'm somewhat skeptical about the results. I would have expected to find a strong effect of income inequality if it's really going to be there at the smallest level. Me too. When it's at a high level, I'm thinking, what is it proxying? And I wonder if you've just, Canada, there aren't that many provinces. Which one is there? Which one's there? Which one's here? Mm -hmm. The US, I would suspect you probably have a strong correlation with red states versus blue states, uh, obesity levels, other things. Um, I think it would be interesting the next step just to kind of find out which one is where and try and think what it can conceivably be proxying for. I suspect it's something else rather than just income inequality that you're capturing. Okay. Well, first of all, I think it's a very good question. The reality is that I and others in the project some others in the project, we talked about this, had anticipated a bigger effect at the local, more local level because other researchers found that, you know, the, the effect of, 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 of so, so it could be any number of things. One thing is the local level in Canada and the U.S. are different. Uh, pretty well everybody knows how that works. The local level in the United States is very often, much more often class-based than it is in Canada. In Canada you can have some quite wealthy people and poorer people living in the same neighborhood. That almost never happens in the United States. It, it's a different kind of a neighborhood effect. So whether that plays a different plays an effect, I don't know. The point you're making about different provinces and the I mean, you're making that point, which is a good one, but also the, 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 the mediating factors of income inequality. 
I'd love to study this different pro by different provinces, but you can't do it because the numbers wash out. And a survey, you don't have enough numbers to do it, and so you can't do it. What I'd like to do is all kinds of things, but as soon as you cross hatch it by anything, the 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 the, the numbers become meaningless. So you, so you can't do it. So we got to work on another data source for that. As for income inequality, working through things like obesity and um, alcohol consumption and fast food consumption, it's pretty clear that that that, that works that way from the from the social determinants of health literature. But again, we can't we can't look at that with these data. So I think you're onto something, but we can't show it. Level three Gini coefficient. Which province is that? And is it possible to say, okay, this is Quebec. This is Ontario and Alberta. This is. So I imagine they were fairly stable. You could at least just. Well, without having enough people in each province, we can't do it, and we don't have enough people in each province. That's the problem. So, so I think it's a good it's a good question. If you can figure out a way to do it, that would be wonderful. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for your presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. Because um, how do you account for geographic mobility? Because you know you said it's a time varying covariate. I think where the people are, but I was sort of thinking, you know, in a, a, around retirement, a lot of people move, and so therefore, you know, where they're getting in later maybe has nothing to do where, with where they lived before. So that yeah. would be one of my questions. The other thing was, you know, your jumpiness and mental health that you saw everywhere. I was thinking it's probably more related about what was happening in, in those years. Because, you know, when you, you could see the one where everybody jumped out was about in probably cycle when it was 2008 and nine. Well, of course you're depressed. Everybody is depressed, right? <laughs> yeah. Because the economy is going down. So I was thinking, you know, part of it might be related to that. And just last point, if I may, uh, you know, your qualitative interview was done in cities. And just looking at the last election, we can see that there is a break, you know, between cities and rural areas. That's right. And I was wondering if, you know, if you had done your interview in rural area, if you would have gotten a very different story from those people? Well, I'm not surprised. These are all good questions. On the point about mobility, um, it turns out that, that despite the myth about mobility and retirement, an awful lot of people stay put. The vast majority stay put. When they tend to move more, tends to be when they get um, a, a chronic illness or a, a, a a sudden onset Alzheimer or something where they've got to move out of their home. But most, the vast majority of people stay put. They might go somewhere temporarily, but they stay put. Um, the question about the, the, the bump, the going up bump, I meant to say that that was 2008, 2009, but I didn't. Um, so I'm glad you said it. But uh, again, it's that intersection, because we're following these people longitudinally. So it's the the notion that they all bumped up at that moment when they were different ages. Th these people were 45 and above, so that means that some of them could have been 65, some of them, you know, 75. So it suggests that it was the 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 economy, but it might be that the economy effect. Of a, a sudden perturbation in the economy like that affects people differently if they're just going into retirement or just going into really old age, old, old age. And, and that's what I would love to be able to get at here because I think it's a quite different thing. The people who were headed to retirement, it came out a little bit in our qualitative interviews, um, were very worried about their pensions because their pen many pensions were eva simply evaporated in 2008 in the US and they were really worried about it so their plans were changed. Geez, what am I going to do? Um, but, but to me this intersection of age when something happens like that, if it happens at a crucial time, Glenn Elder's work shows this with children in the Great Depression, but if, if an economic perturbation happens 
and you are at the very moment where you're vulnerable to it, it can affect you throughout your life. And that might be what's happening that people were thinking about retiring. So, so I meant to say about that bump, as to rural people, we didn't interview rural people, we interviewed city people. We tried to get working class and middle class and we thought that was, that was a good start, but no, no rural people, we didn't interview any rural people. But it would be interesting to speculate. Um, because issues of farm and leaving the farm when you're older is a, is a question and farm inheritance, but that's not what we looked at. But it would be interesting. I think there was somebody over here. Thank you for your presentation. No, just briefly. Just briefly. Uh, so I think everyone's interest in the the first two graphs that you show about the top earners in both countries. So, but I think this, uh, you, it is very difficult to make any inference from your results to those top earners because there should be very few top earners in these surveys. So I, I just want to know how, how do you feel about the generality of your research to the overall population? Well, um, Thank you. that's a really good question because with any surveys that we get, um, you know, these are nationally representative surveys, so the best we've got. So, and, and then we've, we've subsetted it by age, so that means the numbers go down. And then as you follow them, of course, you, the numbers uh, go down too because there's always attrition. But um, we haven't got anything other than national representative samples to go with, so um, I wouldn't want to generalize too far, but at the same time, it is a nationally representative sample. So the numbers are not tiny. Um, they are for the, for the qualitative interviews. I wouldn't want to go too far generalizing with that, but what we tried to do with those was to flesh out some of the other findings by looking at it more in depth rather than saying these are generalizable. But yeah, I mean, with any survey, you're going to have a problem with generalizability, but if you're going with nationally representative surveys, I think that's the best we can do, unless you go with census, and if you go with census, you generally don't have the full kind of answers that we need to, to look at these questions. So, so it's a kind of a problem. I think it's one we're all sensitive to. How do you reconcile your results with uh, recent studies about the decline of uh, life expect expectancies in the U.S. for uh, middle-aged white population? Uh, studies by uh, Case and Denton and, uh, mm -hmm. showing that you know with the uh, uh, epidemic of uh, pain. Um, yeah. Painkillers, pain uh, you know, opioid. opioid. Yeah, well, the notion of the, the change in life expectancy growth, of course, first occurred to demographers. You speak to the demographers, we all know this, but it first occurred dramatically with the Soviet Union, the end of the Soviet Union, where, where the, the change in life expectancy for men dropped like a stone. And all of us, I think, were just bowled over by that because it's not something that we have seen. We've seen, you know, epidemics and, you know, things like that, but this was a kind of a socioeconomic phenomenon. Um, and what's going on in the U.S., it, it's still not clear how widespread it is, uh, but it does seem to be a similar problem to the Soviet Union demise. It seems to be related to um, job precariousness, income inequality, um, um, loss of hope because the suicide rate, uh, particularly among middle-aged men, is, is high, probably higher than we know uh, because uh, there's a reluctance to um, classify some single car accidents, for example, as suicides. Um, the reluctance to classify any death of a middle-aged man as suicide. So I think it's probably way underestimated. But, but the fact is that the socioeconomic conditions, which I think were pretty 
pretty vivid in this last election. I don't want to dwell on that, but there were some pretty pretty serious statements saying talking about loss of hope you know loss of that optimism that I'm uh, that I talked about here loss of this this American dream kind of concept which you know we've known about mobility declining in the US for quite a long time but you know it was kind of visceral in the election where you saw some of that um, so I don't know I sense that if it is widespread and it's not just in certain counties and certain parts of the um, of the economy then we probably have a phenomenon similar to what's going what happened in in the demise of the Soviet Union um, but we'll have to wait and see um, it would be interesting and grim to look at some of this uh, relation of income inequality more 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 seriously with that in mind um, because the problem with any longitudinal work, any longitudinal work, of course, is that people leave and die and everything else. But when we're dealing with this group, we get more of that. We get more attrition. Um, and the attrition is not um, without bias because we all know that working class people die earlier on average than, than, upper, than upper class people. So it, you know, it's not without bias. But, so that's a real, real issue with doing this kind of work. At the same time, I think we have to try to do this kind of work to follow people from midlife into their later years rather than just assuming that our future is going to be you know, just like our parents was. It, it, it's going to be different. And evidence of that's quite clear. Just recently, I mean, there was a big study coming out from somebody saying dementia is going to explode, you know, because we're going to have all these older people and everybody's going to be demented. And then we find out, no, no, the, de the rates of dementia are going down, which, you know, might be expected because we eat better on average. <laughs> we, we're better educated. Um, you know, uh, uh, more vaccines are available. All kinds of things going on that would would uh, would limit dementia. At the same time, there will be more older people, so maybe the the numbers would be greater and the rate less. Who knows? But but the notion is that there are a number of myths about this that we have to explore. It's a good thing because it keeps us in business. <laughs> really. <laughs> Uh, I have a very, I mean, I'm very pleased with the paper. I, uh, I'm just concerned about the, the, the way the result came out to be. Uh, I mean, income inequality is not just, uh, it's measured at different level. And indeed, I think the, the multi-level approach is a good one to address those. Uh, but it seems to me also that there are cross-level interactions, you know, you, the fact that you have a community where people have a given level of income, then it relates to the regional and national, uh, you know, the, the, the inequality in incomes at different levels are not independent. Yeah. And so I would like you to uh, consider that, especially in relation to the question that uh, Tom asked uh, earlier, you might want to do that. It would sort of help you to see some of those things. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a tricky business. You're absolutely right. Um, it's particularly tricky when you have um, different patterns of, of um, living arrangements in, in, in different parts of the countries, both countries. Uh, so I don't think it's straightforward to work out. Um, and it may be totally the wrong way to go. It may be that we just want to look at um, national income inequality and see how that plays out or provincial income inequality and see or the state and, and look at it that way. We put this community aspect in there because, first of all, because we could, because we had the geographic identifiers for the two countries, and because there have been some evidence to show that neighborhood effects are big, um, including some quite important studies in Montreal about that. Um, the, the question I, I have really, and I, I can't quite work this out, is how does that work in neighborhoods? If you've got a poor neighborhood right here, is the neighborhood effect circumscribed by that neighborhood or people go next door to the next door neighborhood and see that they have better shops? And you know, how exactly does that effect work? And you know that you're living in a poor neighborhood, but it might be that you have a lot of solidarity and community spirit in that poor neighborhood where these richer folks next door don't talk to each other and have nothing to do with each other and you feel lonely all the time. It's never clear to me exactly how that works. Maybe I should be more of a psychologist and talk with this other Susan McDaniel. That's why you should be the president. Yeah. So you're supposed <laughs> That's to it. That's it. <laughs> so 
So thank you, unless uh, someone wants to ask a, a last question. I don't see no one stepping up uh, online, so I think it's about time to say thank you very much very for accepting welcome. our invitation and joining us today. It's a great pleasure to have you. Thank and you thank all you all for, for being out. here. Merci à tous de vous être joints à nous, as well as uh, thank you for people online. So see you next time. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me.